Hello, all you fine bronies and Pegasus sisters. Welcome to the NBS show. It's time to hike up your skirts and run in high heels as we talk about an episode review. I'm your host, the man, the myth, the hippogriff, Silver Quill. And joining me today are my co-hosts in, in craziness, James Cork. Hello. And Norman Sanzo. My big brother, best friends forever. Like two peas in a pot, we do everything together. I'm tempted to let you continue to see if you know the whole song. No. Nope. Or should I just, or should I just destroy you now? Destroy me now if you must. <laughs> let him keep going, let him keep going, and then destroy him. Add insult to injury. And if the song wasn't enough of a hint, we're gonna be talking about Brotherhood Social. Perhaps the greatest Big Mac episode of all time, you can tell my bias. <laughs> <laughs> Is there any other Big Mac episode? It only took five seasons to get a Big Mac centric episode. Mm-hmm. Oh, that is that is a good a good question. Right now, this is the greatest Big Mac episode because it's the only <laughs> Big Mac episode. <laughs> but he's had many a fine role. Oh, well, if you consider the comic, the comic's much better. <laughs> oh, well, we're getting there. But so. Be warned, all ye, we're going to be talking about this episode. We're going to be talking about some of the events that transpired with it. And so we will start with just our overall impressions. And usually this is inverted alphabetical order, but I like to invert the world around me. So I'm going to invert the inversion. So wait, alphabetical order then? Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> yeah. Oh, believe- dear, no, that means it's me. It's me first. <laughs> ah, no, I don't want to be on the first. No, I don't want to be on the shooting line. I don't want to be shot. <laughs> Uh, too bad, muchacho. Hop two. <laughs> okay. Um. Well, uh, yeah. Okay. Like you guys said, this is the first Big Mac episode that we have had ever. I mean, this this uh, show when it first was uh, developed and everything, it is clear that they didn't have much of an interest to give the background characters or even the secondary characters um uh, a bit of the spotlight. This was, uh, from the very beginning, the story of the main six and their adventures as the elements of harmony and uh, the, the magic of friendship explained through these six characters. But as seasons went forward, they started to become a bit more bolder and uh, uh, not the rock, the, mm-hmm. the active. And it was season two that was very experimental. That was the first time that we saw a bit of Big Macintosh having some personality to him. Like, we saw him... Scalding the the Timur Crusaders and falling in love, but really nothing well, to his character. What? Well, falling in love is very loose Being forced definition. In love. Being forced you're, in love. You're my schmoopy doopy pie. Pie. But uh, yeah, like what what I'm trying to say is that uh, we haven't had this much experimental things going on a season since perhaps season two, like. As much as I like seasons three and four, I think they were very safe. For the first time that we have an episode focused around Big Macintosh, I think this is great. I mean, this, uh, this, this episode, Dave, Dave Polsky did a fantastic job with the writing. Uh, because it has, uh, it has both parts of his, uh, both of his traits when it comes to writing. It has a lot of laughs and it has a lot of heart. And even though they are separated by, uh, by, you know, a very clear cut in the story, like the comedy and the, and the, and the pathos are, they are not combined, they are separated one another. It's pretty neat, the way it's done. I love this episode. Definitely one of my faves of the season. I know I have said that already two episodes in a row, but I don't care. This episode is great. And Norman, what do you think of this here episode? This episode was cringe-worthy at points. Because of the whole, Big Mac dressing as a girl and acting up like she, he, <laughs> Big Mac was playing the role really well, too well. And it's embarrassing at points, but I think that's what it was going for. Where it's cringe worthy, but oh my god, this is a train wreck, but I want to see what happens. Yeah, my phone's on ready. Let's see how it goes. So overall, it was not bad of an episode. Cringe worthy, yes. Train wreck, yes. But good episode. And also at the same time too, it does have that valuable lesson. It does give you the feels. And personally, if you're a big brother, like I am, and I'm sure James is, I'm not sure about you, Silver, but if you're one of those criteria, this show tugs at your heartstrings a lot. Yes. It does, it does 
say a lot of things. And being that Big Mac is the first for the family, first child of the family, and having Applejack overshadow him in terms of affection by Apple Bloom, that's just soul crushing. But hey, we'll get to that more when we review it. And boss, what about you, man? Oh, it's got me boss now. For, for the record, I am the younger of two brothers, so I can't speak to being the big brother, but I've often been wishing for brothers to be given a fair showing here. This is a show aimed at girls, and, you know, never forget that. But I've often felt they've been excluding part of their own audience by saying, oh, you have a brother? Well, we're not going to focus an episode on you. It's sisters only. And that can actually lead to an uncomfortable topic for this episode, the fact that the sister of social excludes girls if they don't have a sister or something in that spirit. That's a critique I'm going to have for later. Uh, but this was an episode that expanded on Big Macintosh, gave him a lot more personality, and really covered uh, part of the issue that he's not great at expressing his feelings. Big Mac is in so many ways a classic stereotype of what guys are supposed to be. You know, the classic view of guys are strong, silent, obedient, uh, maybe a little aggressive. But Big Mac throughout his time on this show has undermined that in little ways. And this, uh, I view this episode as an extension of that. And so really to tackle it is, is to go bit by, go through it scene by scene. But I enjoyed his presentation. There were some cringeworthy jokes, but they're intentionally cringeworthy. Mm -hmm. you, you find some humor in the discomfort. And this episode did great for uh, both Rainbow Dash and Scootaloo. Oh, yes. Showing how, oh far, yes. showing how far they've come together. So without further ado, I think it's time to uh, don our makeup and go hip deep into spoilers. And put our voice in a higher octave. Oh. Uh, no? Yeah, I'm not going to do that. Okay. Scratch that then. Yeah, no, you're but... going to end up with a scratchy voice for sure. Oh, wow. I should have a counter over here to see how many times we say Peter New is a national treasure and he <laughs> should have a he should have a celebration day. Because, my God, this man. Okay, uh, but we're going to be talking about the episode now. Oh, so, oh. spoilers yes, ahead. Mm -hmm. Spoilers ahead as we witness the writing of Dave Polsky with storyboard by Mike West and John Young. So, we begin on the Apple Farm. Where else would you find the Apple family? I don't know anymore. <laughs> In an There's... iTunes store! <laughs> oh, no! Oh, there you go. Steve, jo The Steve Jobs Farm. <laughs> uh, basically, Granny Smith and Big Mac are going through the attic with all the cobwebs and stuff. I'm intrigued by the film reel that they have stored there. Are you sure that's not a wheel? Um, maybe it, it's the... No, actually, it is... From the photos, it looks like uh, a film reel, but you're right. It's just a wagon wheel. Yeah. But either way, Granny's on the hunt for a blue ribbon she wants to give during the Sisterhood of Social. But Big Mac, one, he's keeping his eyes on his little sisters who are enjoying playtime. And then an old toy he found, one that a Apple Bloom adored in childhood. After the opening credits, Big Mac tries to get it on the fun a little. But Apple Bloom only has eyes for the future, and coming up to the Sister of Social, where she and Applejack uh, will get to compete. And I, I adored uh, Applejack and Apple Bloom in Sister of Social, giving up their spot to give Sweetie Belle a sister for the day, mm -hmm. and just showing what a great dynamic they had. Sister of Social is my favorite episode to date. Wow. Uh, I, I consider it like the quintessential. So this is living up to a lot. There's a big shadow. Funny enough, Big Macintosh, the biggest who casts the physically largest shadow, feels like he's can't compete with it with Applejack. So he goes off to sulk. Poor him, man. Like he tried to well he he do he does the only thing that he knows how, which is playing with a toy that he knows Apple Bloom loves, which is the funny looking dragonfly toy. And yeah, it didn't really work out that well. And sulking begins. Sulking begins. And it prays to Applejack. She knows something's going on with her big brother. Mm -hmm. And she goes to talk to him. She's probably one of the few who could coax him into speaking about his feelings. Mm -hmm. Or Twilight, if you go into the side of his head. <laughs> well, that that's just an invasion of privacy. What's that? Uh, yeah, in Equestria, that's a legitimate question. <laughs> 
But of course, timing is everything. And of course, th- this is where we tie into Made in Manhattan mm-hmm. as Applejack is summoned by the map. There's no, there's no, there's no, um, going about this stuff. Applejack's gonna miss it. Applejack's gonna miss the sister who's social. Oh, poor her. Poor her. And, and Apple Bloom is in full drama mode. Oh, yes. Of course. And judging by this, this means that they travel overnight. Yay. Makes sense. Yay. To Manhattan, yes. But, uh, Big Mac is just trying so hard to, to get Apple Bloom out of the dumps. And Apple Bloom seems to slip into this, uh, minor depression very easily. Mm. She was like this way over cutie marks. She's like, she is a true worry wart. <laughs> Uh, I can't sim- I cannot help but sympathize with Apple Bloom, to be honest. Yeah. And you know, she's young. You're missing an event. You can't really console console her with uh there's always next year. She's yeah. mad. She's mad and sad right now. Yeah, because she wants it now. Uh, but poor Big Mac, he he's trying so hard to help her. Mm-hmm. And he's trying his hardest. Yeah, even Sweetie Belle and Scootaloo are trying to cheer her up. Although, uh, Scootaloo's just too excited to be with Rainbow Dash at this sister of social. Oh, yeah. Because as, now here's the thing where I start to get a criticism. Oh. Granny Smith, Granny Smith says that the sister of social has always had a loose definition of sisters. Mm-hmm. Uh, basically, as long as you share the bond or the spirit of sisters, you're good. Mm-hmm. So why can't Big Mac just compete? I know. That, that's the thing that I've been meaning to ask. I've been, that's the whole thing. Like, <clears throat> if you have a sister, like, sister who social bond between siblings, sister, why couldn't they just do it? That, eh, but, eh. Well, it is kind of, it is explained that they say, uh, we don't, ha- we don't really consider the term sister to be that important. Well, yeah, but the thing is, they the, they don't say it right away, though. Yeah, even the judges uh, agree on well, the term sister. We always have a loose definition of sister. They even say that. So yeah, I mean, even if Big Mac competed in the event as Big Macintosh, there would be no problem. But it seems that well, he's trying to find her long lost cousin. Well, here's here's the thing. It's never explicitly stated that Big Mac can't compete, but everyone behaves on that assumption. Mm. They stress that uh, there's always next year, there's no one to compete with, uh, none of the cousins can make it in time. So no one thinks to ask, can Big Macintosh just compete? And the answer is no. So we enter what is one of the most <laughs> controversial moments in the show. Oh my, what is that? Big Macintosh shows up uh what was his name golden harvest i like i like to call her macarena <laughs> macarena no but officially yeah, was her that, name. that's the that yeah the, the her name is or- orchard blossom uh, orchard blossom Ca- so cousin orchard blossom cousin orchard blossom and oh my goodness should we just tackle this concept right out right out of the gate yep let's talk about the elephant in the room the yes. elephant in the room uh Guys, your thoughts on this? Let's Let's start with with, uh, James. What do you think? Uh, I'm going to bring this up later on when we are talking about uh, another scene that's going to happen. But from the very beginning of cinema that I can remember, actors have dressed as uh, as their different gender and have actually won awards for portraying the other gender. I mean, Linda Hunt won an Oscar for uh, her performance of a male character in a movie. And, uh, in, in other movies, usually comedies, like Some Like It Hot, the, you have actors, male actors, disguising themselves as female characters to being, to not be adverted. So it's like, to me, it's fine. I don't see any problem with that. It's a callback to how things, uh, how things used to be on a more simpler time when people didn't, you know, get offended by absolutely everything. Mm-hmm. Where even breathing too heavily will be offensive to people who cannot breathe heavily. I think the thing that happened with this whole controversy, God, I hate to say this, but I think is SJW and Tumblr mentality going absolutely out of the gate and missing the point. Like this is not out to offend anybody. 
I think this was just meant to be fun. As for me, well, here's the thing. I've been growing up with cartoons for my, well, let's just say my whole life. <clears throat> I've seen Bugs Bunny, I've seen Disney, and I've seen even strange cartoon anime characters. And I've seen Bugs Bunny dress up in drag a lot of times. I've seen Dale from Chip and Dale, Rescue Rangers, dress up yeah. in drag. Or dress up in one of those... You, you know what I mean. And I've yeah, yeah, seen yeah. animes that does the same thing because they're probably influenced by American culture. So, for me, when I see this, this is just... Oh my god, Big Mac, this was your plan? Come on, could you find something better? Oh god, Big Mac, why do you do this? I was not thinking, I'm offended. No. No. Well, speaking of someone, uh, in my own videos, I blundered into the topic of gender identity. And, boy, I got to see on both sides of the, of the issue how people were uh, very sensitive to the concept of gender identity and other people were very sensitive to the concept of censorship. And it's a hard compromise because you don't want it. Peter, Peter knew high praise to him for making a statement in the wake of the criticism. He posted about the difficulty of not feeling comfortable in your own skin. Uh, not, uh, not really feeling like the world is seeing you for who you really are. And having people weigh in on your identity where they really have no right. And so I can empathize with the concept of feeling like the people aren't seeing you for who you are and not wanting to just be the butt of a joke and have your identity reduced to that. In this case, however, I, I do feel that this is not intended as a, as a slant against the transgender, the transsexual. If anything, this ties into, as you, as you say, uh, Norman, and James, the, the older concepts of guys have dressed in women's clothing before for various purposes and various goals, none of which I view as trying to mock anyone. Yeah, I mean, this was just a bad plan done by Big Mac. That's about it. Well, the funny thing is, making fu when, when we make fun of gender stereotypes, case in point, this past Halloween, The Simpsons did a pre-Halloween episode. And when they were talking about adults wearing costumes, they had McBain, the the Arnold Schwarzenegger parody, okay. singing about his secret fantasy. He's dressed as Jessica Rabbit. Okay. Nice. Now, here's McBain. This, basically, the stereotype of masculinity. Mm -hmm. You know, he is meant to be the true 80s action man. Yes. And deep down, yeah. deep down, he just wants to live out this fantasy. You have Big Macintosh, the most masculine uh, stallion. By know, default. Infinitely strong, infinitely uh, quiet, patient. Uh, and he, every now and again, he wants to play with a doll. He wants to, he, in one book, he joined the Crusaders in a tea party. He has machismo to him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so when he dresses up in this, he is not, he is not insecure about his identity. He's just doing this to help his sister. It's done out of love, which I think really speaks highly. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but more than anything, it's making fun of our, our expectations. We think he'd never do that because he's so masculine. And mm -hmm. here he does it without blinking an eye. And you think, well, in some ways, I think the episode is laughing more at us and what we expect. You know what this whole thing reminds me of? You, 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 you just, you just gave me the clue. You said, uh, you said machismo, you said masculinity and all that. This whole shenanigan with the whole gender identity and all that, it reminds me of that kerfuffle that happened earlier this year when Mad Max Fury Road came out and everybody was saying that movie has way too many women doing too many awesome things. Mad Max is supposed to be the star of the movie, not the women. And I'm like, that is such... That's not a word. I know. I don't care. I have to say it like that. That's not the point. When people complain about this kind of thing, they are clearly missing the point. And in, in this one, they are missing the point. It's not about gender identity. It's about something funny. And something heartfelt. Yes. Like I mentioned before, the when I saw this, it was not uh, insult, insult, rage. 
I I'm saw, so triggered by this. Yeah. For me, it was, oh my god, Big Mac. That's a terrible plan. That's a terrible plan. Abort, abort. That's what I see. A terrible plan. Abort. Bad idea, bad idea. But back to the episode, mm-hmm. there is, uh, some fun with the way Big Macintosh interacts with everyone. Oh, sorry. Or- Orchard Blossom. Basically, there's Sweetie Belle, who's instantly onto him, and Orchard Blossom says, oh, you're so observant, and Sweetie Belle is just charmed right off the bat. That's adorable. <laughs> I think, Thank you, I Sweetie Belle, for being so smart. <laughs> I think the episode put itself into hot water a little when she said how weird it was. That was probably the biggest trigger for people. Yeah, but come on. like You have to remember that these are kids. Kids say the darndest things. Well, they say the darndest things, but people hold fiction to a different standard. But then there's, you know, Rainbow Dash is competitive about it. We're not going to take it easy on you. That one pony is smitten. Mm-hmm. There is shipping in this episode. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> that that one guy who does uh, happen to be a reference to the movie, some like it hot. <laughs> uh, I need to watch that movie, yo. You need to watch that movie. It's really good. From what I'm seeing here is that they participate in the event, the sisterhood event. And there's a song here, guys. There's a song. There's a song. Well, yeah. Unfortunately, Big Mac's time in the Pony Tones does not avail him. Come on. He's a baritone. He's a baritone. He's a baritone. Yeah, he cannot sing in, like, uh, a falsetto. (laughs) You know what? He should have gone and took some poison joke just to... Well, you don't know what that would have done to him. True. Maybe, maybe that would have turned him into an actual man. <laughs> but anyway, after the song. But after the song, after the song, Rainbow and Scootaloo. Oh my goodness, you can take that show on the road. <laughs> oh wow, they're they're awesome. Like skipping, like I I've seen competitive skipping, and they're awesome. And Big Mac and no, who's that? Orchard Blossom, Orchard Blossom, and Apple Bloom. Yeah. They're trying. Yeah, they're trying. They're trying. And you can even see those two stallions like, I hate my life. Actually, that's kind of funny. Stallions do have a role in Sister of Social. It's just serving. Eh. <laughs> Here's the thing. They call this episode Brother of Social, but hey, you, you got to realize there are only two brothers in the whole town. Um, let's see. Thunder Lane and Rumble. Ah, uh, true, true. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, oh, they they don't get to compete then. Oh, that's sad. Yeah, they're uh, well. Okay, I'll, I'll harp on this later, but I'm saving ammunition all right. basically. In all honesty, it's kind of the same joke. Big Mac trying to to be something and being a klutz. He underestimates the fragility of the world around him. So it comes time for the big race, and good lord, this guy steamrolls everybody. And he, this is the start of his downfall. A true downfall. Mm-hmm. I mean, have I skipped anything you guys really want to talk about? I mean, each each no. event is fun in its own. No, we're good. Uh, I think it's I think it's uh, fine. Uh, you can you can keep going. Mm-hmm. We're good. Uh, Alrighty. So Big Mac, Orchard Blossom, steamrolls through everyone, even Rainbow Dash and Scootaloo, and cloppers their way to a blue ribbon. But uh, here's the thing: Big Mac here almost doing a touchdown with Apple Blue. <laughs> Don't spike the ball. <laughs> but yeah, they got DQ'd. Reason? Because Big Macintosh was unladylike in his co- in his competitiveness. He was so again, you know, some people argue that guys are just naturally more violent. I don't think I think in this case Big Mac was just he's Big Mac. The whole world around him is cardboard. True that. I think the the thing is Big Mac is competitive. He has a competitive streak with himself. Like, the way that he and Applejack tend to, well, jokingly bet about stuff, like, in that one episode where, well, it's in season one. Um, what's that thing again? I forgot the title. James? Season one episode? Ticket, Ticket uh, Mask. Season, season one episode of uh, Big Macintosh and, no, you're talking about Fall Weather Friends. Yeah, Fall Weather Friends where Apple Big Mac got hurt. And yeah, no, you're talking about Apple Box season. Yeah, Apple Box season, that one. Yeah, Big Mac got hurt, and Applejack says that I could just buck all the trees, and Big Mac says no. And you can tell that oh, they have this. I'm not gonna lose interaction. So we don't know what 
Applejack says to Big Mac, but hey, it's one side of the coin. We we it's it's a family, so you have that kind of thing. And I'm guessing that Big Mac doesn't want to lose. Like he wants to win. And in this game, it proves it. Really? I got a very different vibe in Apple Buck season. Now, in, in Ticketmaster, Applejack bet Big Macintosh if she got all the apples harvested, he'd dance down the street in a hula skirt. Yeah. Which, unfortunately, we didn't get to see. <laughs> well, uh, maybe that's why he got hurt. That's the theory going on the fandom, is that oh, he got you. hurt because of the... Of the <laughs> oh, there of you go. But uh, Big Mac has never struck me as terribly competitive. He's always been kind of uh, acquiescing. He gets annoyed when Applejack is too controlling. But Apple Bloom flat out says, "You, I know you like to win. It's like, really? I've never seen him do that. We don't see Big Mac that much in doing his thing. So, well, to me, the clue was with the bet. The bet, right. And uh, what was the other, some other thing? Oh, when they say it's unladylike to... Uh, to be violent. All I can think of is Fall Weather Friends where Applejack and Rainbow Dash are pummeling the daylights out of each other. It's like so ladylike. Yeah. I, I do understand what the judge was saying because marriage can be violent if they want to. But in a game, you have to have good sportsmanship. And what Big Mac did was not good sportsmanship. He has he had poor sportsmanship. The track was destroyed. People may got hurt and... The chicken coop was destroyed. Poor chickens. Hugging Poor crying. chickens. Oh no, Scootaloo doesn't have a home anymore. Oh no. No! <laughs> oh, Scootaloo's a chicken joke. I'm an idiot. Yep. Never mind. <laughs> yeah, but still, there, there's that, there's that. But one of the, this is one of the things that makes the, both this episode and Sisterhood so good. Last time, Apple, uh, Applejack and Sweetie Belle lost mm-hmm. the final competition. They were just shy. Mm hmm. And they didn't care. They celebrated. This one, well, they lost. Big Mac and Apple Bloom lost. And Apple Bloom is obviously upset. But it gives rise to this great moment later. Fun fact, this is the first time we see Big Mac without a yoke. Yeah. Well, not true. What about his Pony Tones outfit? Uh, true, but his neck is covered. So, yeah. Fun fact, this is the first time we get to see his bare neck. Oh God! Big bag of time. Put some yolks on you. I'm <laughs> seated in front of all these ladies. Oh, oh, the turn. Oh. But uh, here's the thing. This aired just shortly after uh, Friendship Games, if I remember mm-hmm. right. Or was it the same day as? Mm, I think it was on the same no, day. The, no, no, it wasn't the same day as Friendship Games. The 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 same day as Friendship Games was Made in Manhattan. Yes, the one we talked about last week. Okay, so here's the thing. Friendship games, and I rolled my eyes at this. Everybody wins. Yay. I don't subscribe to that line of thinking. I don't agree that you should get a medal for just showing up. Nothing happens if you don't show up. It's like an Xbox achievement for turning the game on. <laughs> this and Sister of Social both show you can lose and still something positive comes out of it. Losing isn't the end of the world. Mm-hmm. It's what you do after that counts. Mm-hmm. Or, or how you view it. One group had fun. One group found a moment to connect. And oh, let's talk about this moment where they connect. Oh God, I, I don't, I, I remember listening to it. I don't remember looking at it because the tears didn't let me look at it. <laughs> I couldn't stop crying this whole monologue. I couldn't. Uh, there is, there is levels of relatability and sympathy. And this one reached the painful level. This hurts so much. I feel a lot for Big Macintosh in this scene. Oh, how could you not? Uh, if, if this does not strike a chord somehow, then I'm sorry, your heart needs to grow three sizes this day. <laughs> this scene, this scene. I, I think I was in tears, like emotions welled up and I got teary eyed and oh wow. And Apple Bloom she was pretty awesome. Well she she'd had time to cool down, thankfully. She is also surprisingly understanding with her brother, which is the least we can ask, really. Yeah, it's true because here's the thing, like I, I think she realized it near the end where oh uh, yeah, I haven't been spending a lot of time with Big Mac. I I've always been spending a lot of time with Applejack. And 
if you've seen the history of the show from the start of season one to season five, the interaction between Apple Bloom and Big Mac has not been a lot. There's that one time where they got shipped, like Big Mac and Shirley. Yeah, that's the only interaction where we did not want to see. But yeah, there's that one time. But other than that, there's nothing else. Yeah, they don't. Well, I mean, Big Mac has adored her from afar in past episodes. A cutie pox where she got her mark mm -hmm. temporarily. He was so happy. This is the thing. Big Mac is not in, feels he's not encouraged to share his thoughts or feelings. And again, that's the stereotypical, the old view of how guys should behave. Don't connect. Don't express. Don't feel. And people wonder why guys tend to have a, end up a little messed up in the head. <laughs> uh, I wonder why. So they get to have this, just this great moment where they connect and watch. And even, even Orchard Blossom becomes sort of maybe even a running joke between yeah. them. And well, that would be, that would be great if it happens. And even when Applejack comes back, like Granny Smith says, Applejack's back. You want to hear her stories from Manhattan? They say, nah, I'm going to spend time with Big Mac for a while. I'm going to talk about it. We're going to talk about stuff. Talk about stuff, and that's that's for the best. Now, we'll go back to the sisters' dynamic for too long, I'm sure. True that, true that. Now, if I could steal the show for just a minute, mm -hmm. uh, Commander Firebrand slash Fiery Joker and I kind of debated the whole exclusion of brothers. Mm -hmm. Because, one, it seems kind of weird to say, oh, yeah, as long as your brother dresses as a woman, that that's the same bond as sisters. What? <laughs> no. That That doesn't sound right. That's not how it is in the show anyway, but continue, please. Well, they say we've always had a loose definition, but they never said your brothers can compete. So here's the thing. Commander Firebrand made the argument that this is part of tradition and identity, and that's important. It is, maybe it's not about all, being all-inclusive, it's about, you know, celebrating the bond between sisters, which is, in many ways, a different bond than brothers and sisters, or between brothers. Hey, fair enough. Now, my issue is that this is not really diff about building an identity. This becomes about exclusion. Who are you excluding from this event? Well, if you're a girl who happened to have a brother, you're not allowed to compete. You're excluding uh, a member of your community for something they can't help. If your sister can't make it, but you have someone who's willing to w participate with you, but they have the wrong gender, you're not allowed to compete. Now you're excluding people who would be a uh, part of this event. Basically, there comes a point where I love to celebrate identity and build memories using traditions. But when they become more about keeping others away than building something, then they're defying their original purpose. And that's unhealthy. Like I say, there is no brother event because there are no brother units other than Big Macintosh, Apple, and his sisters, and Rumble, and Thunderlane. And don't forget Twilight and Shiny. Well, he, he uh, you know, even before this episode, he'd never visited. Yeah, yeah, true that. And, Thankfully, and, we will see more of Shane Armor in future in a future episode. We'll, we'll see more of him. Thankfully, it's subjective. Uh, mm. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and then also don't forget Pound and Pumpkin Cake. When they get older, uh, what what happens if, if, if Pumpkin wants to compete? Ah, true. And... There's that rumored episode about Fluttershy's brother. Well, we uh, that was this episode. But really? That was. Yeah, well... that was this episode. Uh, early this season, and I actually wanted to talk about this. Early this, uh, se this, this season, like halfway through this season, we had someone, uh, quote unquote, leak the synopsis of the 13 episodes that we have left. And according to them, the the Halloween episode that we just watched, <laughs> that was about Princess Luna trying to scare away the ponies, and it didn't work out. Mm, okay. Yeah, and according to them, there was a, this episode, Brotherhood Social, was about Brother Shai trying to get along with her brother, and Shane Armor and, and Twilight helping her with him. Yeah, totally legit. It appeared on 4chan. This is real. Well, it sounds like someone was just really unoriginal with their uh, imaginings. Well. Sounds you like think? a good show. But anyway. Well, there, there's still talk that Fluttershy's brother may show up in the next season. May. Which would be unique because then Rainbow Dash would be the only biologically single sibling. Well, no, non-sibling. Oh, but 
but at least she got to bond with Scootaloo. And they did win the competition by default. Yay. Although, you know, deep down, Rainbow wants to have a clear competition against Big Mac. Mm -hmm. No no pretense. Just, I want to know I can beat you at a race. (laughs) But here's the thing also... Here's here's the thing also where I noticed that um, the sisterhood social event. To me, the way I look at it is that well, Equestria is different from how we are in terms of society base because our society is more based on males in command or in control, while in Equestria probably it's the opposite. So there's more female lead. So most events are going to be catered around them and the amount of female to male is more one-sided to the female. This, hence, you can see Ponyville are littered with female ponies. But is that something to celebrate? That I've never, I've never enjoyed the concept that feminism or empowerment is just repeating the same mistake and swapping targets. Honestly, Silver, I don't think that is feminism there. It's like an event catered to, well... Sisters, yay. It's just that, an event catered to sisters. Nothing to do with feminism, nothing to do with that, because of the amount of mare to stallions are different. But again, this episode casts it in a realm of exclusion. And a lot of people say, well, guys exclude women from all manner of things. How does it feel? Well, okay, fine, fair point. We don't, there's not a lot of inclusion, but now you know what it's like to justify excluding based on gender and how it can feel empowering. Can you really say you're coming out of this on the moral high ground? To me, it's an event, like a boys only event or a girls only event. It doesn't really matter to me. If, if I'm not invested in it, I'm not invested in it. Well, that's the funny thing though. There have been no gender exclusive events to date. The Sister of Social is the only one as far as I know. The Equestria Games had male and female competitors on the same field, I think. Yeah, it's true. They have male and female, but it's just the thing, Silver. Like the Sister Who Social, they even say that they had a very loose definition of sister. So, to me, in my head, if they explain it a bit more than just saying that phrase, I mean, in that phrase for the pony universe, for us audience, it'll just be funny. But for the pony universe, the way I'm looking at it is, okay, if they explain it like, okay, if you have an older older sister or a younger sister, and if you're a brother, you can compete. And if they want to go beyond that point, you can say that, okay, if you're related in some way or another, you can compete. Doesn't matter if you're cousin or something like that. You can compete. Like, if they explain it, the only rule is you have to be related. Well, th- even then, Rainbow and Skulu aren't related in that regard. But everyone acts on the assumption that a guy can't compete. That's what this whole thing is based on. So it stands out because with Equestria, there's only one character who's ever defined things by boys and girls, and that's Spike. Again, we're back to Ticketmaster, huh, where he says, oh, that's just something girls like. And then this season, he wants to be Princess Spike. So that's the only time gender has been a divisive topic. So it stands out in this world that is usually kind of egalitarian. You know, guys and girls compete together. Guys and girls can do things without exclusion or underestimating one another except here also i'm still waiting to see a female guard pony oh yeah, true that. yeah that... i'd love to see some female in the military and and on the on the guards as well i don't know why they have such a problem adding uh yeah. adding a female character in the ranks technically they do well i don't know if the wonder bolts count no nah, secret the closest really thing the closest thing we have seen to a female character in the in the army was Twilight dressed as a Spartan for Night for Night. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of weird. I, but here's the thing. The Royal Guard is useless. They're usually there to get owned. That's why they yes. only put guys in there. Yeah. They don't want to make female characters look useless. Mm. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so we're, okay, arguably we're assigning a lot of meaning to this, but it stands out to me that this is the only time this show has really gone into excluding someone based on their gender. And I'm not happy about that. I can understand. I can understand. I, I can clearly understand why. I mean, I get the feeling. I, I understand. As a, well, let's just say that if I was a pony in Equestria and I have my sister with me and I can help her compete in the game because, well, I'm not a bigger sister. I feel bad. I'll probably find a way to help her. But honestly, I'll feel bad and, and I don't feel good. How would you look in a in a dress? 
They do say that I have a girlish figure. Oh, you my. do, Norman. You do. Oh, mm. my. I know that. So, so I have room with you. Oh, my. That's probably the most uncomfortable topic. Well, okay, this the debate over gender identity and what this joke can represent and the, the concept of exclusion based on gender, either towards male or female. Both of these come up. And that's the funny thing about stories. Even even if they're aimed at a young audience, even if they're meant to be simplified, they carry meaning. People see meaning. They assign meaning. It's an expression of ideas. And we want to challenge those ideas. So when people say, oh, it's a kid's show, don't think about it. I was like, no, it's because it's a kid's show I want to think about it. It's because I want to know what are we saying to kids. Yeah, because kids are not dumb. That's the that's the thing that people misunderstand when it comes to media and entertainment for children, is that children are not stupid. They do question things. They have a lot of curiosity. They will make a lot of uh, they they will ask you for the meanings of this and that and what does this what is this because they are curious by nature. Uh, that's the problem when it comes to bad entertainment for children. That's why it's not bad to put it under the microscope and talk about it. Now, there is a limit to everything. We don't need to start questioning why is there no freckles on Applejack's face on these pictures and why does, what, what does that mean? Uh, what, what but, if they're painted on? <gasps> oh, no. What, what, what if they remove her freckles so they can sell more toys? No, that's stupid. That's stupid. Some of the some of the more in depth analysis that I have seen out there, they are just rubbish. Uh, this theme, however, talking about these themes, talking about this subject, it, it's not rubbish. It is worth talking about, especially because it's been going on for for a while already. It's been going on for decades, also even for centuries. Of course, it's good to talk about it. Of course, it's good to discuss it. It's not good to get mad about it, though. True. It's not good to get angry and start insulting, calling people out, and sending death threats. It's well, definitely not good to have the show staff getting involved into it. The thing is, love it or hate it, the message is there. It's about brotherly love, sisterly love, being nice to one another, being nice to family. The message is there. If you can look beyond the point of Big Back in a dress, you'll get that message. Well, that's the other thing. I mean, Peter Dew talked about this in his in his uh, statement. Big Mac doesn't feel comfortable expressing himself. The only way he can show his love is through action. Mm -hmm. Just do it. Just, oh, we're going all Shia LaBeouf on us again. And in a funny way, again, Big Mac, as the classic stereotype, guys are encouraged to show their affection through, well, competition, aggression, even violence. And that comes through in this episode as well. So, uh, believe me, there are the feels. Ultimately, we, we've gone on about these topics for a good while. I think we've covered it in pretty good depth. So it's time for final thoughts. And again, alphabetical order. Oh, you're me. Ah, uh, okay. Uh, most emotional episode of all season, by far. I don't think any other episode coming up is going to cost this amount of... Uh, uh, I know what I'm saying. I know the episode that's coming next week. I know what we're, we're going to be talking about. I know. I don't care. This one hit me way too close to home. This one is way too relatable, and I like it way too much. I mean, the, 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 I think this is. I'm not gonna. I, I'm not, I don't know what you guys are gonna say, but this is. I think Dave Polsky's best writing to date. I love the man. I love. I love his writing. Loved. Loved him since season three, and I think his job in season four was excellent. But god damn this episode is just so much better than all the other season 4 episodes combined and those were awesome episodes and well as for me like I mentioned earlier on I like this episode this episode is cringe worthy at best there's a certain point of the show where I was just hiding my face because of the cringe worthiness with, with how Big Mac was acting I'm not saying that I don't identify don't like it it's just you know when you see something like that, you it's just cringe worthy, and you just want to. It's just that. It's more of an entertainment value than anything else. And the message was good. I love the message. It hit home, and the little speech between Apple Bloom and Big Mac was heart heart touching, heart heart touching. I can't say the word. Heart heart wrenching. Touching. 
touching yeah. heart touching. It touched your it, it, it touched it's, your it's, heart, Norman. It, yeah, it's touched your heart. It's not heart touching. Yeah, it's, it, it's pretty touching. Yeah, it, it's, I don't know. It's that word, Sh- yeah. Show me on the doll where it touched you. <laughs> uh, but, <laughs> but anyway, right, yeah. Right, so, right, right here uh, in my breeches. Uh, but anyway, it gives me the feels. Other than that, just looking at the interactions between the ponies, the scene, the art, it's just good. We we never mention about the animation because well it's good. If we just keep saying the animation looks good for each episode, we'll be redundant. But I just gotta say, the animation for this one looks good. The rule set for sisters is just confusing. I just wish we got more info. But other than that, all around good episode. And is it me or is just whenever Dave Wolski writes an episode, people will get mad. Of course. Well, sometimes people want to be mad. I think we should also acknowledge that. I mean, remember Twilight Time. Twilight Time, the Ring Dawned, the Friendship Games, the Friendship Games conclusion, oh, they made it just about Spike, nee. the Ring Dawned, oh, they made the Ring real, nee. Twilight Time, oh, they made it about the Kitty Mercury to say there's no place in Twilight, nee. it's like, you guys cannot be happy with anything. <laughs> <laughs> ah, well, he, he, he delivers some quality products, including this episode. Absolutely. So, all right, fair enough, I have an issue with the underlying source of the conflict you know this assumption that a a, a guy is excluded even when he really wants to support his sister i have an issue with that i i think it's very much worth discussing but that does not decrease my enjoyment of this episode that expands on big macintosh's character uh it shows a new dynamic between him and apple bloom it shows apple jack as more sensitive to her brother's state of being and Rainbow and Scootaloo have bonded and become so in sync that it's just wonderful to see them interacting like this. And the fact you can lose and something positive will come out of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, that is something I feel like we don't show enough now. It's always got to be either either the hero wins or everyone wins. It's okay to lose, especially when you gain something from the loss. Well, I... I- I think that kind of lesson can work if only it's done right. Because a show in recent memory that does that is, remember uh, Do- Dodgeball? <laughs> Actually, I never saw that one. Oh uh, yes. Well, I'm not going to spoil lo- it then. But well, they, I, you kind of did. They lose. Well, you just have to watch it, man. You just have to watch it. It's re- it's a really fun show. You just have to watch it. Oh, okay. But anywho, are, do we have any closing thoughts on the overall? We've done our final thoughts, but anything we didn't cover? Mm, not really. I mean, we we did a blanket talk about almost everything that we wanted to talk about. And oh yeah, um, the old pony guy, he didn't get the chance to give flowers to uh, Orchard. Aw. Well, he'll he'll get over it. <laughs> yeah. If if it's he tries okay, to get. Oswald. <laughs> If he tries to get between a uh, marble pie and Big Macintosh, we might have trouble. Oh, spoilers! <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm mm-hmm. just, later on. I'll tell you guys something. Anyway, oh, before we end, a guy on the YouTube comments asked me this question, and well, technically he asked everyone in the crew. He asked, um, "What are your top three favorite episodes for season five?" Till episode 13, which was, uh, what was that again? Do princesses dream of electric sheep? Yeah, uh, the, do princesses dream of magic sheep? Yeah, that's that, from episode 1 to episode 13. Yeah, so he asked, what are our favorite episodes from episode 1 to 13? Top 3, if you can. I stated mine on the comments, and if you guys can, well, share your thoughts, share your, uh, what you call this, favorites. Okay, uh, you wanna be last? James? James, uh, no, we're we're going in alphabetical order here. Oh no! no. Consist- okay. <laughs> Consistency. <laughs> Why? Okay. Um. Poof! What a question. Uh, for the, and even with that, even if it's limited, I still find it difficult to see. Let's see. Um. Well, obviously, it's, it's slice of life. That one, I said. That's an easy one. Slice of Life, which I liked it, but I don't think I like it more. I, I remember I was saying that my favorite new episode is a Slice of Life. I I think I want to change my mind on that regard. I really like Amending Fences as well. I think I liked Amending Fences more than I liked Slice of Life. So uh, Amending Fences, a Slice of Life, and I think just for sheer amount of surprise and uh, trickery, 
bloom and gloom because that episode kept me guessing to the very end. I was like, where is this episode going? I want to see the end. Oh my gosh, what's happening? A uh, few other episodes have done that to me. Norman, what did you post in the comments? Uh, see, I'm, I'm backtracking here because I don't want to give uh, the different answer because if I did give a different answer, it's like, what? That's not what you said. So, okay, I found the comment and my top three are thank for the memory. Number two is the lost treasure of Griffinstone. Three is slice of life. And I gave him a bonus two answers, amending fences and do princess dreams of electric sheep or magical sheep. Alrighty. And for me, the number three would be amending fences. Number two would be the cutie map part two. And number one would be tanks for the memories. <laughs> I will say that Brotherhood Social is, I'd have to re-evaluate that list in the wake of more recent episodes. We've had a lot of really good ones. Oh, yeah. I mean, if we're just talking about Until 13, those are pretty good. Like, my reasoning for giving thanks for the very top billing, or well, in no particular order, really. It's just, like, I just love that episode. The song was awesome, and Rainbow Dash's soft side was kind of cute. And Griffin, we need more of them. And Slice of Life is five years in the making. Come on. We influenced that episode. Well, either way. Point is, we've had a lot of good episodes to choose from. Mm -hmm. Although, I don't know if Princess Spike is on anyone's top list. Uh, <laughs> no. no, I don't know. I won't say it's that bad. I would just, I'm, I'm not my favorite. Well, okay, but speaking of favorites, I'm sure some people are going to want us to talk about our, the next episode we'll be reviewing and where that stands in our favorites. Our next review is Crusaders of the Lost Mark. Da, 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 da. So please come back and join us as we discuss th this world-shaking event, this fandom-changing drama, the fact that Diamond Tiara isn't unlikable anymore. What? No! No! Somebody, somebody went and redeemed her! Ah! How is this possible? We need a villain made out of pure evil. No, oh, that's fine. We have Angel for that. Oh, yeah, true that. Okay. <laughs> Oh, well, even Angel's had some moments this season. Uh, yes, yes, he has. <laughs> but th that that lies in the future. Mm -hmm. In the present, we we want to thank you for tuning in to the MBS podcast, and we hope you are all having a fine old time. So, if there's nothing else, I just want to thank you all and say I'm Silver Quill. Ah, uh, you first, Norman. We're going uh, uh, the other way around. <laughs> uh, your big brother, best friends forever. Like two peas in a pod, you did it, you did everything together. Ow! Thank you, thank you, Silver, thank you so much. <sighs> and this has been James Cork signing out. What is a bell? Now? Yes, got a bell? Got a bell I have a bell. There. I have nice. a bell. <laughs> oh, wow, that hurts. My bell going against your sound box. Oh, anyway. <laughs> I won't use it anymore. Don't worry. Oh, anyway, we'll see you guys next week. I need to go to hospital now. Ah! <laughs> All right. Adios. Have a good one, everybody. Bye. Bye. Quick, Silver, help me. We have to hide the body. I'm not dead yet. <laughs> this episode really turned... Oh, shut up. You're just complaining. You're going to be that soon.